everybody, I am joined currently with Scott McDonald, one of the animators on none other than the Moonbreaker game that has just been released. Scott, hello, how's it going? Hi, it's going great, thank you very much. How's your Gamescom been going so far? Great, it, the, the game's been very busy, we've had a lot of press demos. Uh, everyone seems to really enjoy the game, I'm really happy. Well, Scott, I've got to ask you, the question that is on everybody's minds right now is the fact that you know Moonbreaker is very much different to the Subnautica series, the game that you guys are infamous for. What prompted the decision to kind of move away from that style and into such a creative IP? Well, it's a couple of things, really. Uh, first of all, we're all really passionate about tabletop games, so we love tabletop games. And we have the opportunity to make a tabletop game because we can make whatever we like at Unknown Worlds. And also, we've changed genres before, so we made uh, a first-person shooter game, Natural Selection 2, and then we moved to an open-world underwater game that we were told not to make, and yet it did quite well. So we're usually we're used to making different games at Unknown Worlds. Used to going against the fog, some people might say. And how long has Moonbreaker actually been in development for? It's been in development for almost five years. Almost as long as, so when Below Zero started development, we also started Moonbreaker development. Oh my goodness, okay, and none of us were, none the wiser. Was it kind of difficult to kind of not tell your friends and family and everybody about what was being put into the work? Oh yes, exceptionally difficult. Um, because we're normally quite an open development studio where we tell people exactly what we're doing but we wanted to keep it secret because we had a lot of interesting things to, to show the world and we're just so happy that we can finally talk about it. And a secret it definitely was, not only for myself, but also all the folks at home as well. So tell me a little bit more about the setting of Moonbreaker, the universe that it's kind of based in. So the universe is um, set in a solar system called the Reaches and it has a brown dwarf star and hundreds of moons all orbiting the star, mysteriously not touching each other. And um, like players can go through the solar system uh, in terms of law, and um, there's like creatures floating around because there's actually air between all of the different moons and things. I don't want to spoil too much, but um, everything everything to do with with uh, the reaches is all in the form of Cinder, like our special resource. So yeah, really really excited for people to learn more about the law, and we're going to be revealing more as we go. And you mentioned Cinder. How do I actually get my hands on some? So in, with Cinder, uh, it's our special resource. It's actually in all of the moons, but it's a limited supply. So people are constantly trying to get the Cinder and maybe it has some adverse effects on the moons, hence Moonbreaker. Okay. Interesting stuff, most definitely. And I believe Brandon Sanderson was actually a part of not only like the development process, but also kind of setting up the law of Moonbreaker. Obviously he was a New York best-selling uh, author as well. So tell me a little bit more about the level of his involvement for Moonbreaker. So Brandon's been heavily involved since almost the very beginning. He's been super amazing to work with. He's written almost one of his giant novels worth of lore about Moonbreaker. And over time, we're going to be revealing more and more about what he's created in the world. And we can't wait to sh show people either. I'm certainly excited to see it myself. Now tell me a little bit more about yourself personally. What is your favorite feature of or mechanic of Moonbreak? Ooh, that's a really good question. I really love um, like some of the ship abilities that we have called ship assists. So there's a one called Orbital Strike, which is basically you can, from your orbiting ship, you can call down uh, like missiles that come down on an area, which can help destroy a lot of units at the same time. It's one of my favorites, and it's also visually very pleasing and satisfying. And I think you could definitely start to assert dominance against your opponents as well. Is it going to be like a big kick to the gut once you get Orbital Strike out of the universe? It can be, but with any competitive game, there's counters to it. So there are things that can help stop it from, from being a problem. I may need to pick your brain, so you need to tell me how to counter every single ability ever in this game. But talk to me a little bit more about how Moonbreaker kind of eases people into the genre of turn-based strategy game. So if you've never played before, we do have something called Quick Start. It's like our in-game tutorial. And you'll be able to uh, learn how to move characters, how to shoot, how to use melee. Um, it's very easy to learn and difficult to master. But by the time you finish the tutorial, you should be ready to play any game against anyone. Tell me a little bit more about how you've kind of captured the real essence of painting physical miniatures and turned it into a digital game. So we've tried to replicate as much of the miniature experience as possible with painting. So you have access to the regular paintbrush, but also like a dry brush to do the highlights. You also have uh, washes that you can get into the deep uh, crevices of like the creatures and it can really pop out the details and things like that so essentially if you've ever tried to paint miniatures before then you'll know exactly how to paint in Moonbreaker. 
And obviously you mentioned the topic of the different finishes you have as well. Could you maybe explain that for the not so artsy folks of us? Yeah, sure. So uh, we have all sorts of different effects. So we have a regular paint, which is just grabbing your paintbrush and just putting paint on something. You have uh, like a stippling effect. So you can, uh, if you, there's like a character with like a tongue or a reptile, you can put little st spots on without having to do it individually. And then we also have um, like uh, decals as well. So you can put, if you really want to put flames on the back of something, you can absolutely put flames on the back of something. And then we have the regular uh, paint tools like the dry brush, dry, dry brush and the, uh, the airbrush and things like that. And you guys, I believe, also have different map designs as well on offer here at Moonbreaker. Can you maybe dive into how we might be able to get our hands on some of these uh, different map designs? Yeah, so we're shipping with three different maps at Early Access, and they're going to be uh, based around uh, different cultures. Uh, one of them being like the smugglers culture, so it's got lots of um, refinery stuff going on, kind of dark and mysterious and things. Um, but they're also going to be shipping another map not long after early access. You're going to have access to around three or four maps not long after we release the game. And is it just going to be the aesthetic of the map that's different, or is there going to be different obstacles placed uh, right in the middle of the map and things like that as well? Is the layout going to be pretty much the same and it's just aesthetic based, or is it going to be the layout changing as well? So we have multiple different layouts for each of the maps. So they all play very differently. And they all have different cover as well. So some have lots of hard cover. Some have lots of soft cover. So some you can shoot through the soft cover easily. Uh, some of the hard cover you can't shoot through. Uh, shoot through. So uh, yeah, all the different maps play completely differently. And is the painting feature kind of going to be available on keyboard and mouse as well as with an art tablet? Because myself, I know my keyboard and mouse usage is not the greatest when it comes to painting. So for the artsy folks, perhaps, is it usable with a tablet? It's absolutely usable with the tablet. So if you have uh, a pen, uh, like a, a Wacom or a, a, any other brand, you'll be able to use pressure sensitivity to paint as well. But if you have a mouse and keyboard, you can absolutely use those. That's amazing to hear. And I believe the customization kind of has no end as well. So obviously we have all of the creative freedom right here, right now, as it is in the current state of Moonbreaker. How do the team plan to kind of continue to expand that? We're hoping to allow you to get your own uh, skins out there to players eventually. We haven't quite figured that out yet, <clears throat> but that's something that's part of the early access journey. Um, wh what we're going to do like to help share players' designs. Right now, players can take screenshots and post them in our Discord or online, and we'll absolutely share those between each other. And whenever you finish your painting, of course, when you're playing a game, your opponents can see your paint work as well. So that's shared between players, at least. Okay. So you're telling me that I'll be able to share my own custom paint things eventually with some of my friends that are playing as well? We're hoping so. We're going to try and figure that out during the early access. I'm certainly excited to see that one come into play. Now tell me, once you eliminate a unit, is it going to be possible at all to add insult to injury, to kind of really rub it in that you've dominated the competition with maybe like a custom finisher or something similar? We, we're not playing on custom finishers, but we are, whenever you level up an individual unit, you will get a special aura around that unit. So when it drops from the sky, the more experience it gets, uh, the cooler Ori that you can select. And we'll also have some available in the in-game store as well that you'll be able to get. I just know that that is definitely going to frighten me. As soon as I'm in a Moonbreaker game and I see that my opponent has well and truly leveled up their character from the very get-go, that's going to be some scary stuff. How many uh, of those kind of uh, essences, the special effects, are there going to be available at launch? Uh, at launch, we are probably not going to have a lot, but uh, soon after early access, we're going to be shipping a lot more. We're hoping to have as many done as possible for early access, but it's, it's early days to say um, how many we're going to have for early access right now. Scott, I need you to dive into the specifics of all of these units and rosters because, quite frankly, I was a little bit overwhelmed seeing so many of them available at early access at that. So tell me, how many units do you kind of begin with? So we have three captains. And then we have their crew, and we're launching an early access with around 50 units, so there's quite a lot. And they are mixed between a melee uh, ranged and some special abilities as well. So you mentioned the captain uh, particularly. Can you tell me a little bit more about each of these kind of uh, roles for the, for the different characters? Yeah, so uh, we have three captains at launch. We have uh, Zax, Astra, and Extilia. They're a mixture of ranged and melee. And then... Uh, the units themselves are again a mix with ranged melee and special abilities and you'll be able to choose up to 10 crew 
with, for your captain when you start a game. It's called a roster. So you form a captain roster with your 10 crew and you, you can select any which one you have available and then you can go into battle with that crew. And what is the significance of having a captain on your team as well? Well, you need a captain, but if you lose your captain, the game is over. So you want to try and protect them and keep them safe. But also, the captains are usually the most powerful in the game, so you also want to use them for attack. So it's a nice, nice balancing act that you've got to deal with. And then your crew can go out and either protect or attack, um, defend, whatever they need to do. And you mentioned that you would have three different types of captains. I've heard a little something about the different cultures of each of these characters. Could you maybe tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure. So we're shipping with three different cultures in early access. We have the Methodori, which are kind of our space Romans kind of thing. Uh, so that's Extilia, the captain, who's part of the Methodori, and also Astra, who's the girl on top of the frog you might have seen in our trailer. She's also Methodori. And then we also have Zax, who's a smuggler, kind of a roguish type character. Um, and they're the thieves, the rogues kind of uh, culture. Um, and then we're also shipping with uh, Cholek as well, which are kind of like plant-based almost, some of them. And they are kind of religious and they, they worship uh, kind of... Well, we're going to reveal that in the future. <laughs> and which of the cultures is your favorite? I think it might have to be the Methodori because they just have this aesthetic to me that's really regal and really interesting and they use a lot of gold, so it kind of stands out. Um, plus, I, I really love Extilia, the captain. It's one of my favorites. Okay, so would you say Extilia is your favorite unit as well, or do you have a completely different favorite unit? No, I think Extilia is my favorite, especially with his voice acting. I think it's just it's perfect. And obviously everybody knows that Moonbreaker is a turn-based strategy game, but how strategic is it really? Oh, you can be very strategic. In fact, I would say more so than a lot of games that are out there right now. So uh, it's all about positioning and blocking in Moonbreaker. So um, if you'll find that it's very, very similar to tabletop games, except that instead of spending like an hour trying to figure something out, you have to do it immediately because we have a turn timer. So you have to be very thoughtful and very strategic on placement behind various different covers, and when to bring out which unit is also very important. So there's a lot to think about. It can be very strategic. So I know loads of folks at home will be very familiar with the notion of pay to win. Can you maybe tell us a little bit more about how Moonbreaker is combating the pay to win notion and how, how we can ultimately end up unlocking uh, captains and crew moving forward? Yeah, sure. So the game is absolutely not pay to win. You can't pay to get an, like a unit that's exceptionally powerful or anything like that. Everything in the game will have the same as everyone else. So you, you won't be able to buy a really expensive unit on the store and, or anything. No, we, we're not doing that. So how can you ultimately end up unlocking new units and crew? Um, so it's not new units and crew, sort of. You have to buy uh, a booster pack, and you'll get part of that when you purchase the game. You can unlock booster packs, and then you'll get new units and new crew. Uh, you can also get new paint jobs as well through the store as well. So it's mostly just cos cosmetic through there. And I know that you can improve the mastery on the individual units as well. Could you maybe tell us how much of a buff does that really end up giving you? So the mastery doesn't actually buff the unit like, at all. So it won't actually make the unit better, but it will increase um, like its look. So you can tell how experienced that a person is with that unit just by uh, the aura around it or when it drops from the sky. So if you see someone uh, a unit drop from the sky and it like, looks really cool, you can tell that person's played with that unit a lot. So you might want to beware. So basically, if you see one of the units fall from the sky and it looks incredibly flashy and impressive, run and hide is what you're telling me. Yes, basically, yeah, run to the corner. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me, Scott. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me.